Well, this morning we are starting a, a kind of a mini series called Better Life. We actually technically started it seven weeks ago, and I gave you two message, but benches, messages by way of introduction. But uh, this morning we're talking uh, primarily in Psalm chapter one. So open your Bibles to Psalm chapter one with me, if you would. Now, everyone here, I would say, wants a better life. And uh, I would say that, um, that there's probably nobody that you know, there's probably uh, people in your, in your family, people that are friends of yours that would say amen to that. We want a better life. Uh, now, a better life requires some things. It requires some things. And let me say this. Can I say this, that, that we have an idea of what a better life looks like? We have an idea of what a better life looks like. I don't know how many of y'all are on Facebook, probably every single one of you, maybe. And, uh, and, and uh, I, think, I think just, just kind of women are, are more notorious for this. There's not, I'm not against women. I'm married to one, okay? So, um, matter of fact, I, I'm, I, I heard this one guy say that, that, that I'm half woman. My, 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 uh, my dad was a man and my mama was a girl, so I'm, I'm half woman. And so there's nothing against women here, but let me just say this for just a second. Can I say this? That... that, that we look at pictures on Facebook and we say that that is the better life. Is that not what we do? Like, I think, I think we, we look at this perfect uh, cook, cookie cutter family and, and you see that the, the, the guy is just dressed up, kind of GQ looking, and, and he's got this nice chiseled beard and, and my wife likes these kind of hard chiseled ends. She does, says, I don't like the rounded, rounded look. She says she wants the chiseled and, and I say, but baby, my face is round, you know? And anyway, so, uh, so the women, they want that chiseled, the tall, dark, and handsome kind of looking guy. And, and they want the kids all put together, and they're not all torn up with ratty clothes. My kids sometimes they wear these really terrible looking clothes, and it's, uh, at times it's somewhat of an embarrassment. Not them, me. I'm embarrassed because I'm not getting better clothes. And, and, uh, and so we look at this, this picture-perfect family. And I think the women, they look at that, and guys, they want that too. They want this like perfect, modeled, beautiful wife with this flowing, in my case, brunette. No, you're not brunette. What color hair do you have? It's brunette. So, and beautiful, bl bl uh, blue or brown? Let me look. Brown eyes, beautiful brown eyes, beautiful flowing brunette hair. And I am just definitely not, not getting, I'm not, this is no brownie points for me this morning. I'm just, I've really stepped in something here. But we look at this perfect, beautiful family and we say, that's what I want. I want, I want a better life, don't you? And I think that that is not always what the better life is. We think that that's the better life. That's our impression of a better life. But we all want a better life regardless of how it may look to us. We want something better. And there's nothing wrong with that. Can I say that? There's nothing wrong with wanting a better life. There's nothing wrong with wanting better than just status quo. I, I, I want to have something better than what I have now. I want you folks to come into this auditorium and leave better than when you came. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And when we get to Psalm chapter 1, I think it really gives us the recipe. I think it gives us the plan for a better life. And we talk about this in our addiction program, that it's, uh, it's God's plan for prosperity. And I want to say this morning that I think this is God's plan for just a better life. If you want a better life, we wind up here in Psalm chapter 1. So let's look at this real quickly, if we will. There are six verses I'm going to read them all, but we're going to focus today on verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly 
shall perish. I believe when we look at this, we see primarily a departing man. A departing man. The title this morning for a better life is one, a man who departs. This deals primarily with a person who is, who is blessed. And when we look at someone who is blessed, there are certain things that a blessed person does not do. Blessed is the man that walketh not. This is what it's talking about. Let me tell you this. I am not a pastor who is rule-based. I'm not a pastor who's rule-based. It's just true. I believe there's something more than just a litany of rules that we follow. Now, rules can be good, and we need rules at times. But I am not a rule-based pastor. I'm a relational, a relationship-based pastor. I look for a relationship in things. The religious leaders of Jesus' time were very rule-oriented. They were, they were all about the rules of the law. Now, I'm not minimizing the Mosaic Law, but there is a purpose for the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law was not to save someone. The Bible says that through the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, the, the, the law, the reason it was there, it says it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be saved by faith. That's the purpose of the law. So when I look at a, at a church who is primarily following the letter of the law, the rules, day in and day out, they can miss the entire relationship with God. And that is a tragedy when I think about a church who just follows the rules and they completely miss the relationship. As I said, the religious leaders of Jesus' time were that way. Matthew 15, 8 says this, This people... This group of people, listen, draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They said all the right things, but they didn't believe all the right things. Listen to this, but in vain, verse 9, they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They were so stuck on the rules, they totally missed the relationship with God. When it comes to obeying God. It's not just obeying a bunch of rules. Now, I think rules are important, as I said. I think that they can be helpful. But we have to be careful because there are some people who are so, so rule-based that they believe that the relationship is the rules. They believe that as long as they're following a set of guidelines, a set of rules, then they have a relationship. Let me tell you something. I'm married to my wife. Probably not much longer. <laughs> Can't tell you what color eyes she has, but anyway. Uh, I'm married to my wife, not because I obey a set of rules, not because she obeys a set of rules. Now, do I come home at a decent time? Generally speaking, the last four weeks, uh, probably been working a little too much, but I generally come home at a decent time. I, I generally uh, mow the lawn. Now that I've got kids that are growing up, they are a blessing to me. And they are the ones that mow the lawn, and generally they're the ones that rake and things like that. All of you with youngsters can look forward to that. That's wonderful. That is not why I had kids. But it is a benefit of having children anyway. Uh, so I try to do these things, and uh, I try to take care of the car, try to make sure I pay the bills. I try to do all of these rules, right, these things. But that does not make me married. What makes me married is I made a promise to her that I was going to love her in sickness and in health. Now, it's not the rule, it's the promise to love her. Those other things do not make the relationship. The relationship is what we get the rules from. Now, Josh McDowell is noted for saying this, that rules without relationship leads to rebellion. You can have all these rules and you can totally miss the relationship. You know what will happen? you'll end up rebelling. And we have to be very, very careful of that. However, there are some things, some rules, that a person who wants a blessed life, things that they ought not to do, some things that need to be changed. And you cannot have a better life and remain the same person. You're going to have to change some things. There's going to be some things that you do and there's going to be some things that you don't do. And while I'm not a rule-based pastor, 
I understand and recognize that blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So let's talk about this, beginning in verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Point one is advice. I believe it has something to do with advice, the advice that we get. The advice that we get. One piece of advice that I'd give to someone is never to take a bad piece of advice. Always be careful. This is important. Know your advisors. Know your advisors. Know who they are. If you're going to get counsel from somebody, know whether or not they are godly or ungodly. If you want a blessed life, if you want a better life, don't get counsel from ungodly people. Don't take advice from people who are not who they ought to be. The advice or the counselor should realize that what they say can either bring life or it can bring death. Matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 18, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit. Now listen, here's the importance. What we say affects people. Not only should the counselor know this, but the one receiving counsel. They all should know this. A second piece of advice that I would give someone, a second piece of advice is to, uh, is to be careful not to take advice from someone, an advisor, who is primarily looking out for themselves. This is a terrible thing that we see all the time, people giving advice for uh, th something that would benefit them. And, I, and I'll just be honest with you, I find the media is doing this. Okay? They, I believe that not just, not just the liberal media anymore, I think that there's a lot of conservative media too that is, that is giving, uh, that is reporting what they want other people to believe. They are giving only information that benefits them. They want the ratings, they want the clicks, they want people to come to them. We have to be careful that we're not receiving advice from someone who's looking out for themselves. We have to be very, very careful of this because our ways are determined by others' words. Our ways are determined by others' words. And historically, you'll find a basis, or a bias, rather, with these advisors. One person said this. He said, a mentor is someone who is willing to give you advice that isn't in the best interest of them. How many of you know advisors like that, that are willing to give you counsel or advice that isn't in their best interest, but it's in the best interest of the others? That's the advisor you want. You want someone who's going to look out for you, not for themselves. 1 Corinthians 10.24 says, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Here's what this means. Look out for the benefit of other people. Don't seek your own benefit. And when it comes to advice and your advisors, walk not in the counsel of those people who are looking out for themselves. And man, I tell you what, I tell you what, it, we see this all the time. People who are only looking out for themselves, so we have to be careful. Look out for the interest of other people. Now, I want to give you a good example of a bad example. So open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. And I want to share with you a story. It's a great story about a young man named Rehoboam. Rehoboam was an individual who had the opportunity to choose between two sets of counsel. Counsel that was good and counsel that was bad. So here we end up in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. Let me read you the story. I'm going to give you some running commentary as we go. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, now here's, let me set the, set the, uh, the audience here. Here's Israel and Jeroboam. They want, they're calling this, uh, this young king, Rehoboam, who is the son of Solomon, calling him, saying, uh, we have a question for you. Now this is okay. I like questions. And you want to answer questions according to wisdom. Here's what happens. This is the question 
that Israel asked Rehoboam. Thy father made our yoke grievous, now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his yoke, which he put on us, lighter, and we will serve you. This was kind of a statement question. Your father Solomon, Rehoboam, listen, your father Solomon had uh, made it really hard for us. And now if you make it easy for us, we will serve you. And he said unto them, Depart ye for three days, then come again to me. And, and the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men. This is good. The old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? So here's these older men. Rehoboam goes to them and says, What do you think? Here's Jeroboam and the people of Israel, and they want to make it easy for me, or for them to serve me, so what should I do? And let me say this, that um, make it easy for people to serve you. Make it easy for people to serve you. If you are a leader, if you are a master, let me tell you, if you are the head of anything, and we're all heads of something, if you're a wife, if you're a husband, if you're children, we are all in charge of something. Just think about it a moment. You'll figure it out. We're all in charge of something. Make it easy for those people who are under you to follow you. Don't make their yoke grievous. Don't put on them excessive burdens. And here we find, how do you advise that I may answer this people, asking these old men? And they spake unto them, saying, If thou will be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servant forever. You treat people right. You serve them, and they will serve you back. You speak kind words to them. How hard is it to follow somebody that just absolutely loves and adores you? It's not that hard. But somebody who is grievous, somebody who makes it hard for you, somebody who puts excessive burden on you. It's very difficult. Verse 8, but he forsook the counsel of the old men. This was great counsel. This was great advice. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him and consulted with the younger men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. And he said unto them, what counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. So now he's consulted with the young men. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, so now this is, the, this is the young man's counsel. He had an opportunity to get advice from good advisors. Instead, he goes to the young men and he gets this horrible advice. And it says this, Thou shalt, thou say unto them, Make my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Horrible advice, by the way. You thought you had it tough under my father? You just wait a minute. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, this is horrible advice. Terrible advisors. He had an opportunity to get good advice from older people who were actually around in Solomon's day. And he totally blew it. So Jeroboam and all the people of and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scorpions. This is horrible advice. Number one, know your advisors. Know the people who are giving you advice. And don't get advice from people who are looking out for themselves. This is a good example of a bad one. Let me just give you a little application. If you're not getting advice from the right person, you will end up in the wrong place. 
If you're not getting advice from the right person, you'll end up in the wrong place. You see, a better life always begins with the best advice. Go to those people who are looking out for your benefit. Go to those people who are always looking out for your benefit. And the best advice always comes from the best advisors. First of all, seek God's advice. That is the first person we go to. It, it, it's funny to me how many times people go to someone else to seek counsel who are ungodly before they just go right to the Scripture. Th th this, is, this is why we, you know, we have this Bible to help us through life. And, and this should be our first, our first area of, of, of consult right here. We ought to go here first. Go to God always for the first piece of advice. Second, don't just get, just don't go to God's advice. Go to seek God's advisors. And these are those who are in constant pursuit and apprehension of God's word and God's truth. Always go there second. First, we seek God's word. Then we seek God's word from God's advisors, his ambassadors, the ones who are constantly seeking his word. Someone who is not seeking God's word will not give you good advice. This is just true. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Listen to this. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? If you do not seek God's advice from God's advisors, you're left with man's wisdom, which is nothing. And I'm just telling you right now, friends, if you want a better life, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. So get good advice. Number two. Number two. Has something to do with attitude. It has something to do with attitude. Look here in Psalm 1.1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the of sinners, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Um, there is a process of influence here, by the way. Can I say this? It begins by what you hear for advice. Next is how what you heard affects your attitude. First you hear something and then it changes you internally. The advice you acquire will affect the attitude you desire. If you are always getting terrible advice from ungodly people, how do you think that will affect your attitude? I don't know how many of you know negative people. I know negative people. And they are positively the worst. I'm just telling you, it's so hard to be around a negative person. And, uh, and it just, I'll tell you, sometimes that attitude just stinks, doesn't it? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know some positive people who just like always have a smile on their face. They're always just happy all the time. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's infectious, isn't it? Like you just get around those people and you're like, man, I just, man, I just, how can you not be around this, this guy and just smile? Like if I stood up here and just smiled, see, I'm telling you, all y'all are smiling. Some of you are not smiling, some of you are sleeping. But at any rate, you want to be around people who don't have this stinky attitude. And I'm just telling you, it's kind of stinky. It, it, but here's the truth of it. It's like, it's like a person with bad breath. It always affects other people, and the person who has it doesn't know they have it. Okay? It's, it's, everybody else can, can sense a negative attitude. The people who are always just kind of like, I just hate life, and nothing's good. And You want to be around positive people, right? Here's the idea. Is that the advice that you hear will affect your attitude. So you end up walking in the advice, the counsel of the ungodly. Then you begin to stand. You begin to stand in the way of the sinner. And the attitude here is the one of uniformity and conformity to the sinner. It's uniformity and conformity. You begin to be like them. Here's the problem. You hear that advice long enough and now you begin to take on the trait. That's the standing part. We become like those we get the majority of our counsel from. And if you're always getting counsel from negative influences, if you're always getting counsel from ungodly people, you know what you're going to end up? You're going to end up ungodly. And let me ask you, is that the path of a blessed life? Of course not. You want to go to the right people to get the right answers. It's always very important. 
And if you're always getting counsel from wicked people, you'll become a wicked person. Now let me say this. We are commanded to stay away from the way of the wicked. We are commanded to stay away from the way of the wicked or we'll do as they have done and we'll follow in their fate. It's just true. This is what will happen. We will become just like them. We will develop the same characteristics, the same attitude. Matter of fact, Proverbs 4.14 deals with this. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. He's saying total separation from ungodly people. Stay away. Don't get advice from them or you will become like them. This is how it happens. We need to completely stay away. Romans 13 deals a little bit with this when he says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. If you are around those people, you'll become like them. One commentator said this. He said, the great lesson to be learned from the whole is sin is progressive. One evil propensity or act leads to another. We will just follow right along. This is, this is the progression of sin. It begins with what we hear, and then it changes our heart. We see this in Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took up the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now we say here is the progression. Seeing it, desiring it, and taking it. See it, desire it, and take it. Progression of sin, right? But wait, there's more. We, send, we tend to miss verse 13. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. It was the advice. It was who she got the advice from. It was her advisor. Had she not been with the devil at the time, the serpent, let me tell you, she would have had better advice. The problem is she departed from listening, walking and talking with God, and now she took counsel from the devil. What do you think will happen when that's your advice? You end up where you're at because of the advice that you hear. So we have to be very, very careful of this. Let me give you some application. Let me give you some application. Bad advice from the ungodly leads to a bad attitude towards the things of God. Bad advice from the ungodly leads to a bad attitude towards the things of God. It's been said before, we've heard this, garbage in, garbage out. We are a product of our advisors. Listening to the wrong people will lead us down the wrong path, and what you hear will lead your heart to direct your hand. This is the progress. This is the progression. There's an old song. It goes something like this. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Come on, let's go. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. If we can get our hearing right, if we can get our advisors right, if we walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, we won't stand in the way of sinners. I think it has something to do with advice. I think it has something to do with our attitude. And thirdly, it has something to do with our actions. Psalm 1.1 at the end it says that blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of the sinner nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The person who sits in the seat of the scornful is one who is now practicing wickedness. They are now doing what their advisors have done. They heard the advice, conformed to the attitude, and now are participating in the action. This is the progress for a bad life. That's why when we begin, blessed is the man that doesn't do these things. Now this point is the bottom of the barrel. 
This is a denier of God. This is a person who, who does more than just denies God. We see it in, in uh, Psalm 14. The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. He is more than just a foolish person. He's a wicked because not only has he said there is no God, now he mocks and he scorns God. People say, well, I'll never get that far. The truth is, is we do get that far. <laughs> That's the truth. We end up where we are headed. And if you are headed with ungodly counsel and you begin to change your heart towards the, having an attitude of uniformity and conformity to the sinner, then you're going to end up doing what they do. The scorner, of course, is scorned of God. And see, that's their, uh, that's their repayment. You see, we, we, all, we all say, well, well uh, you know, we need to pray for them, and, and, and somewhere deep down inside, we say to ourselves, we say to ourselves, well, I, I hope they get what's coming to them. And let me tell you something, friends. They do get what's coming to them. And in Proverbs chapter 3, it says this, that the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Here it is. Ready for this? Surely he scorneth the scorners. Surely he scorneth the scorners. He mocks and scorns those people who mock and scorn him. They do get what's coming to them, by the way. And that's not a pretty picture. And if you want a better life, you don't want to end up where they are, by the way. That is a terrible, terrible place to be. If we don't get our advisors right, our attitude's going to be wrong, and our actions will just follow their fate. And that's not where you want to be if you want a better life. We have to start by knowing our advisors. We need to start by knowing our advisors. Can I just conclude by saying this, that this is the recipe for a terrible life if you follow this? And if you want a better life, if you want a blessed life, and there's nothing wrong with that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you saying, I want a better, blessed life. I, I, I hope that everyone here is not, is not just saying, well, I just, I just am okay with where I'm at. I hope you say, man, I just really want what's better. And we've got to go out and we've got to get advice from the best people. And those people are the ones who are in a constant pursuit and apprehension of God's Word. And if you do that, and if you do that, you'll have good advisors. You'll have good advisors. The best advice that was ever given to me the best advice that was ever given to me was when someone said, Joe, you know that you can know for sure where you're going when you die. And I said, I want to know this. And I sat on a guy's porch when I was 17 years old until midnight. And he didn't show me the illustration I'm about to show you, but he did tell me the basic facts. That you must know that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And all of your righteousness is as filthy rags, and you need someone to save you from your sin. Because if you don't have someone to save you from your sin, you'll end up making a payment. I use it, this wallet to illustrate this. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and this wallet to represent all of our sin. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says God loves us but hates our sin. The Bible says we all have this sin. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And you say, well, I, certainly I do good. Well, certainly I, there's some things I do that are good, but bottom line, friends, is doing good is good, but doing good isn't good enough to get you to heaven. You've got to be perfect in order to be in heaven. So here we are with this sin. The Bible says God loves us, hates our sin. And here's what the Bible says. It says that the wages of this sin, the penalty for the sin is death. That's separation from God. Death. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not church membership. The wages of sin is not walking an aisle or praying a prayer or raising a hand or it's not giving money or baptisms or anything like that. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. I want this hand, and I mean it reverently, to represent the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that God loved us and made a payment by his death on the cross. Now notice that. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus Christ came to this earth 2,000 years ago to die on the cross for your sin. He didn't come to this earth to join a church to pay for your sin. 
He didn't come to this earth to give money to pay for your sin. He came to this earth to do the only thing that was possible to procure your salvation, and that was to die. People say, well, Jesus died on the cross. Sure, he could have suffered on the cross, not died, and he would have not saved us. He had to bleed and had to die, suffer and die. The fulfillment of prophecy, by the way. He had to die, though, to make a payment of death. 2,000 years ago, he died. And the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not water baptism, not walking in aisle, not joining a church, not coming to church. Faith alone and Christ alone is the only thing that gets us to heaven. It's when we in the quietness of our own minds say something like this, Lord, the best I know how I believe that Jesus died for me. You can say, well, I believe that Jesus died for everyone, but if you have not received that free gift for yourself, you're not saved. You have to receive the free gift by knowing that he died for you, by believing that he died on the cross for you. And if you have not done that, you're not saved. You're not going to heaven. But see, salvation is simple for us because it's just faith alone in Christ alone. That's the best advice I ever got. And I would say that's the best advice that I could give you is to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today. Please don't leave this room without doing that. Please trust Him as your Savior today.